village of Marymount, Ohio is home to over 3,000 residents. Located 10 miles east of Cincinnati, Marymount offers charm, convenience, and a strong sense of community. The U.S. Department of the Interior recently awarded Marymount National Historic Landmark status because of its historic importance as a planned community. In 2007, Ohio Magazine named Marymount one of the five best Ohio neighborhoods in which to live. The school system is nationally recognized and has been awarded the Blue Ribbon four times. Marymount residents enjoy community activities like the Annual Taste of Marymount and the Kiwanis Arts and Crafts Fair. Shops, restaurants, and movies are within walking distance. The architecture, village parks, and many trees add to the beauty of Marymount. Long before the current planned community, this area was rich in history. For generations, people had known of an area called Potter's Field, near the bluff overlooking the Little Miami River. Pottery shards and artifacts littered the ground, mute testimony to the earlier inhabitants. In the 1880s, Dr. Charles Metz, a physician from Madisonville and a talented archeologist, obtained permission from Phoebe Ferris, who owned the land, to dig there and see what he could find. The results were astonishing. Metz and his men soon uncovered evidence of a Native American village that existed here from about 1400 to 1650 AD. The area was designated the Madisonville site since that was the closest town at the time. Dr. Metz published a report of his discoveries which came to the attention of the Peabody Museum at Harvard University. Harvard provided money and manpower to expand the scope of the excavation, uncovering stone tools, bone jewelry, mounds of clay pottery, and many more artifacts that suggested a simple subsistence way of life for the inhabitants. However, more remained to be discovered. In the 1980s, the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History mounted a dig at the site. Advances in the science of archeology span helped this group build on the work of Metz and Harvard University in learning more about the mysterious tribe. Since the Native Americans were gone before any settlers arrived, we have no written information about their name or way of life. Everything we know has come from the artifacts they left behind. Much of what was discovered resides in museums all over the world. Although Cincinnati's Natural History Museum has a small collection from the site. What we now know as Marymount was part of a tract of land settled in 1788 by the Stites and Ferris families, whose remains rest in the Pioneer Cemetery adjacent to the Marymount Community Church. Major Benjamin Stites and his brothers initially established a settlement close to the Little Miami River, naming it Columbia. After frequent floods, however, they relocated to higher ground, where Marymount was later created. The Ferris family joined the settlement at this point. They farmed their land, milled their own grain, and sent it on flatboats down the Little Miami to the Ohio River and on to markets in New Orleans. Two of the brothers built houses on their land. Joseph Ferris built his home in what is now Fairfax. Eliphalet Ferris began his house in 1802, and it still stands on Plainville Road in Marymount as one of the oldest brick structures in Hamilton County. Descendants of the early settlers and others continued to farm the land for a century until the early 1900s, when philanthropist Mary Emery of Cincinnati turned her attention to the national problem of poor housing conditions in industrial cities. Mary Emery had moved to Cincinnati with her family in 1862 at the age of 18. Four years later, she married wealthy industrialist and real estate speculator Thomas J. Emery. The Emerys moved in circles that included Andrew Carnegie and William Howard Taft. They split their time between their Walnut Hills mansion, Edgecliff, and their estate in Rhode Island, which was named Marymount. Thomas and Mary were generous with their fortune and supported many charities at home and across the country. Mary acquired major works of art, which she later donated to the Cincinnati Art Museum, along with a wing bearing her name. However, tragedy struck the family. Their younger son, Albert, was killed in a sledding accident at the age of 15. Several years later, Sheldon was struck with an infection from which he did not recover. Then, in 1906, Thomas died, 
leaving Mary with his vast fortune and no... Mary Emery turned to her charitable work and poured her heart, soul, and money into a number of projects, the largest of which was the creation of Marymount. She developed the concept of creating an entirely new town as a way to provide an alternative to the crowded and unsanitary living conditions in downtown Cincinnati. Slaughterhouses, factories, and squalid tenements filled the riverfront. Mrs. Emery appointed Charles J. Livinggood to manage the ambitious project. Livinggood had been a friend and classmate of the Emery's older son when they were at Harvard. Livinggood had come to work at Emory Industries following Sheldon's death. He proved to be a capable manager, and Mary trusted him to run her various charitable projects. This man has been to me a son, a helper, and an advisor in everything I have been able to do. To him, I owe the inspiration and knowledge that has made possible. She sent Mr. Livinggood to Europe to study how other industrial cities had helped alleviate their housing problems. He was impressed with several garden cities located near large metropolitan areas. He brought back many of the concepts, especially the idea that these communities should be for all classes of people, with apartments for workers of modest means and houses and building lots for those with greater resources. Mary Emery quietly began buying land just east of Cincinnati and had Living Good hire one of America's top town planners, John Nolan of Boston. Mr. Nolan had gained national acclaim for his creating a comprehensive development plan for San Diego and for a town near Kingsport, Tennessee, among other projects. Mrs. Emery determined that her village would be only the first of many similar communities built near other large cities across the country. Marymount would become a national exemplar. John Nolan was anxious to begin work on the ambitious project. By definition, a planned community is carefully laid out from its inception and is typically constructed in a previously undeveloped area. This contrasts with settlements that evolve in a more random fashion. The first step would be to establish a general plan for the whole project. This general scheme should be supplemented by plans for the special sections in which community life would center. Marymount will start fully equipped. The village of Marymount benefited from John Nolan's attention to detail and his forward-thinking ideas. He redirected Route 50, where it is called Wooster Pike, to run through the village center, put utilities underground, and developed a central heating plant connected to homes and businesses so residents would be spared the mess of burning coal in their houses. Nolan wanted the new town built in a natural setting with lots of land given over to parks, woods, and even a golf course. The streets followed a radial plan with some cul-de-sacs and arcs to promote a peaceful environment. The area now called the Old Town Center was designed to be the hub of the village life with homes, apartments, the school, church, and shops all close at hand. The ambitious and complex plan developed by Nolan could only be brought to reality through the creation of the Marymount Company in 1922. This group was charged with managing the construction and marketing of the new town. Marymount was to be a completely private project, with the company's operating funds coming directly from Mary Emery. Of the 70,000 shares of stock in the company, Mrs. Emery owned all but five shares. The remaining shares were split among the five directors. On April 23, 1923, Mary Emery lifted the first shovel of dirt to begin work on the village of Marymount. Construction continued in earnest in 1924. With John Nolan's plan to guide them, work began on the church, school, apartments, group and single family homes, as well as other public buildings. Almost a thousand laborers with mules, horses, trucks, and hammers began carving out the new town. While some of the larger structures, such as the recreation building, were built by contract, all the group homes, apartments, and several of the detached houses were built by the Marymount Company. Employing 900 people at the height of construction, the Marymount Company was careful to use top quality materials and construction methods. Nolan's plan called for clusters of houses in strategic neighborhoods built with different architectural styles. A brochure for the new town described the Denny Place homes. 
Native field stone, warm in color, stucco, and brown shingle roofs give these homes a singular charm, gathered as they are in friendly fashion about their tiny bit of square where children may play in safety. Over 70 acres were devoted to parks and recreation. Dogwood Park with its ball fields, stream, and woods was enhanced by the construction of a two-acre lagoon where one could while away a summer's day in a canoe from the boathouse or strap on skates when the lagoon froze in winter. Many other parks and green spaces are scattered throughout the village. The little town center, which we call the Old Town Square, began to take shape. And in October of 1924, a Marymount Company employee and his family were the first to move into the new town. The Marymount Company handled all the services, such as fire, police protection, garbage removal, and general maintenance. Recreation and natural beauty were top priorities, and the newly arriving residents had many options. Mrs. Emery kept a close eye on Marymount's progress. Charles Livingood corresponded often with his mentor, whom he fondly called Guppy. Dearest Guppy, I am so glad to pass on to you these cards, for it is another of my dreams come true, to see the children in their white frocks at play on the lawns about the school and in the park. Next, if that Sunday school idea works, we shall see them about this church. Ever yours, Charles. Life was good for those who had moved to Marymount. However, that number was fewer than Living Good had expected. Sales of the houses and lots were slow. In a letter to John Nolan, Living Good says, Nevertheless, I am not discouraged, because I have built for 20 years ahead. I believe that with continuing prosperity and enlarging of ideas about the value of a beautiful home, people will live someday in these and similar houses. As more families moved to Marymount, they found a community devoted to their needs. Their children had a brand new school called Dale Park, staffed and operated by the Marymount Company. This arrangement continued until 1931, when the Plainville School District assumed responsibility. The recreation building, now the parish center, was the center for indoor fun. This Italianate structure housed a bowling alley, rifle range, a stage for amateur theatrics, and room for various organizations to meet and have parties. Marymount was conveniently located on a streetcar line. Residents could hop on the number 72 trolley and head to Hyde Park and on to downtown Cincinnati, or go the other way to Milford. Milford. During the period that the Marymount Company ran the school, company directors would often rent the streetcar and take the students on a field trip to the Cincinnati Zoo, which at that time was owned by Mrs. Emery and her friend, Anna Sinton Taft. When trolley service to Milford was canceled, the cars would make a circle at the corner of Miami and Rowan Hills in Marymount for the return trip. Today's trolley turnaround park marks this location. The last trip for the number 72 car was in January of 1940. Although the village was beginning to be populated, Mary Emery's death in 1927 and the Great Depression two years later slowed construction and sales. Living Good and Mrs. Emery had planned to use profits from rentals and sales to finance similar communities across the country, but the lackluster sales and high cost of building materials ended that dream. Two years after Mrs. Emery's death, her sister Isabel Hopkins had a bell tower, or carillon, built in Dogwood Park in memory of her sister. Its bronze bells played by local caroloners still ring out for Sunday concerts in the summer. By 1930, the Marymount Company was engaged only in routine maintenance and in completing the recreation building. In 1931, the Marymount Company was dissolved and its remaining duties transferred to the Thomas J. Emory Memorial, which ran Marymount until its incorporation in 1941. During this time, the only major construction projects were the high school on Wooster Pike and the movie theater. In 1941, the city of Cincinnati moved to annex Marymount. The residents voted against annexation and for incorporation with a mayor and a six-member village council. The first mayor was E. Boyd Jordan. The village was divided into six districts, each of which has its own representative on village council. Marymount established a tradition of town meetings 
with its own town crier to open the proceedings. The town crier evokes the spirit of the English garden communities that Living Good visited and used as a model for the Marymount concept. During the Second World War, construction of private homes in Marymount came to a virtual standstill. There was a flurry of building after the war, however, and then again in the 1970s. In these later years, public amenities were added, some of which had appeared on Nolan's plan but had never been built. The Marymount swimming pool was developed in 1957. In 1962, the village added the municipal building to house administration and the fire and police departments. In 1970, a new high school was built. The former high school building became the Marymount Elementary School. Some buildings that Nolan had envisioned were never built, such as a town hall and a large theater complex. Today, the village of Marymount continues to fulfill the vision of its founders. Mary Emery, Charles Livingood, and John Nolan applied the best principles of town planning to Marymount and created a community with physical beauty, convenient shopping, dining and recreation, and a real sense of fellowship among its residents. Good morning. Is the sun a little brighter there in Marymount? Is the air fresher? Is your home a little sweeter? Is your housework somewhat easier? And the children, do you feel safer about them? Are their faces a bit ruddier? Are their legs a little sturdier? Do they laugh and play a lot louder in Marymount? Then I am content.